worship team. It's good to be together with you again this Sunday, our second Sunday back together, and we are going to begin a new sermon series for the month of September, and we're going to call it Be the Church. Um, this is really uh, picking back up where we actually started off at the beginning of the year. If y'all can remember that far back, we kind of started off the year of 2020 as the year of his mission. And we had a big push that, you know, we, we got these t-shirts made and, you know, my life is a mission trip and we're preparing and we've got 40 days of prayer and fasting and, and we're ready to join God on his mission. And then boom, the whole world gets, gets turned upside down. But here's the thing. God is still God. God's still on the throne. God is still at work and we are still the church. And so this month, that's what we want to be looking at. How can we be the church? How can we be the church in our homes, starting at home as individuals and starting in our homes? And then how can we be the church at work in our schools? Schools are starting back up. A lot of in-person learning is starting back up, be in prayer for the teachers and, and the parents and the kids that are going to be going back into this environment where everybody's kind of learning uh, how to do this on the fly. And so please pray for everyone this week, but how can we be the church in our work, at our work, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in the culture, and even in the world? Uh, that's what we're going to be looking at uh, during the month of September. And I, I think we know this, we, we understand this, but a lot of times we just lose sight of the fact that we are the church. The church is not a building, Okay? We, we get that in our heads, but a lot of times we just lose sight of that. The church isn't a building. The church is not a physical location. It's not 3016 Selma Street. That's not the church. Um, I, bring up that picture, Karen, if, if you've got it this morning. And, and this is just a, a good reminder, I think, of really of what the church is. You know, a lot of times, again, we lose sight of the fact that we do come and we do gather in a physical location to worship and to open the word of God. And that's, that's of utmost importance in our lives as believers. But this place, this building is not the church. You are the church. Do you see all those individuals in that picture? Every one of you sitting in the blue chairs this morning, you are the church. And when you leave this place, you don't stop being the church. You, you take it with you. You are the, the representative of God in the world on a daily basis. You are God's people. We're, we're the family of God on his mission. We're sent by the Holy Spirit to be his hands and feet. We don't just go to church. We are the church. I, I think I've got another visual that, that'll help us understand that this morning. If, if you'll look at that behind me. How many of y'all are meme fans out there? Okay. Yeah. The, somebody took this and turned it into a really great meme to help us remember that we are the church. We're the church. Some, sometimes we need to get smacked, don't we, to be reminded that we are the church. And, and, and here's another thing. A lot of times, here's, here's the way that we measure even success as the church. Okay? We, we measure success by the three Bs. Let me tell you what the three Bs are. Bodies, buildings, and budget. Okay, isn't that, isn't that a lot of way, to, to how we measure success in our church? Bodies, how many people do we have in attendance? Okay, so there, there's one way, how we're, how we're checking, how we know that we're successful, the number of people in attendance, and then buildings, you know, we've got to have bigger, better, fancier, more, uh, you know, bigger buildings, and then budgets, the same with the budget. If, man, if we've got a big budget, that, that must mean that we are, are successful. But here's the interesting thing. You know what the pandemic came and did? In one fell swoop, it wiped out all three of those things. It wiped out the bodies. We couldn't meet here physically. It wiped out the buildings. We're, we're not coming together into a physical location, this building. The budget, you know, we're, we're trusting God. We're saving some money here and there. But in one fell swoop, the pandemic knocked out those three measures of success. Again, a reminder 
that we are the church. We're the church. Sometimes we need a wake-up call. We need a Batman slap that reminds us that you and I are the church. So what is God trying to, to teach us? What's he trying to reveal to us through what's going on in the world right now? I think one realization is that we have we, when we come together in a physical location, a lot of times, we separate ourselves off from the rest of the world. We, we've separated ourselves. We come here to a physical location. We do the religious activities and, and we live out our faith here. And that's, that's good, but it's separated and apart from the world and the culture outside of this physical location. And we lose sight of that a lot of times. I have my church life that I come together and do things here. And then I have my everyday life once I leave this place. I check it off. Jo- Jordan, I-, I-, I like the way he said it. We-, we leave it here and we don't take it with us. Again, because a lot of times the mindset, we, we come to church, we gather, we worship, we pray, we're in the word. That is, again, don't get me wrong. This is of utmost importance of our lives. But a lot of times we check it at the door. We check it at the door. We walk out of this place. I did my church stuff. Now let's get on with my normal everyday life. It's important to come together. That's fuel for the mission in our lives. But here's a question for this morning. What happens in our lives the rest of the week? What's happening in our lives the rest of the week? Are we refueling outside of this church building? We come here for fuel and it's good and we worship and we pray and we're filled up. But what are we doing during the week once we leave this place? You know, we're, we're gathered here for maybe two or three hours a week corporately, and then we're scattered for the remaining 165 hours of the week. Where are we going to have the most impact? Where, where can we have the most impact? Bob Roberts uh, once said, great worship services don't change the world empowered, impassioned disciples do. Empowered, impassioned disciples. You and me, we are the church. We're the ones that God has called to change the world. My life is a mission trip. Jesus formed the church for his mission. He said, go into all the world and make disciples into the world, to the ends of the earth. Be filled with my spirit. Be my witnesses. Make disciples. I shared this earlier this year, you know, in the the book of Acts, when uh, Jesus is telling his disciples, wait in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit's going to come, and he's going to come down on you, and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so the Holy Spirit comes and they're filled with the power of the Spirit. They begin to share the good news of the gospel. But guess what happens? They stay in Jerusalem. They stay in Jerusalem. And it's not until a great persecution happens, actually a tragedy, the very first tragedy in the church. Stephen is stoned to death and this, he's the first martyr and this great persecution arises and the church, guess what happens to the church? They scatter to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And guess what they do when they scatter? You know what happens when they scatter? They're sharing the good news, their own mission with the Father. And so that, that, that tragedy, God used that tragedy, that, that persecution to actually accomplish his purposes, scattering them, sending them out. You weren't meant to just stay in Jerusalem. I want you to go into all the world, to the ends of the earth, and make disciples. With this pandemic... He has scattered us. 
So the question is, what have we been doing? As the church, what have we been doing as God has scattered us? God's teaching us, reminding us that we're the church. We, we are his called out ones. That's, that's what that word church in the New Testament means. Ecclesia, the called out ones. He's gathered us together as his family. And then he scatters us. He's called us into his family. And then he sends us with his message, empowered by the Holy Spirit, living as kingdom citizens in the world, extending the rule and reign of Jesus, inviting others into the family. Come, be reconciled to God. Be a part of this amazing life that God has given us and he wants you to have and experience eternal life through his son, Jesus. First, be my disciples. Come together, be my disciples, and then you know what? Go and make more. Go and make more. It's not just for you. Go and make more, baptize them, teach them. All authority in heaven and on, and, and on earth belongs to me. So go and I will be with you to the very end of the age. It's my power. It doesn't even have anything to do with you. You just be faithful. You do your part. You say the words, I'm going to fill you with my spirit and you're going to be my witnesses. I'm going to do the work. I'm going to draw. I'm going to save. I'm going to accomplish my purposes and extend my kingdom. I just need you to be the church. Be my disciple and then go make more. Uh, Ralph Garcia got uh, baptized last Sunday. And that was a, an amazing thing to, to see in his life how God is, is just all over that beautiful young family back there. And we baptized Ralph in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he has a new life. He is a new creation. He has a new identity and a purpose, just like the rest of us who have chosen to give our hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. With God as Ralph's father and as our father, everyone in the church, we are a part of the same family. We're a part of God's family. We are sons and daughters. Everyone who believes and receives Jesus, we've been given the right to become children of God. God's our father. And with Jesus baptized in the name of the Father and the Son, with Jesus as king of his life, Ralph and all of us as the body of Christ now live to serve him and others with our entire lives. He is the Lord. He's the king of our lives. We're following the example of Jesus in our lives. Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for others so that others could be brought into the kingdom. We baptize Ralph in the name of the Holy Spirit. That same spirit that empowered Jesus now lives in Ralph, empowers him. That same spirit empowers us and sends us out on that very same mission to be his witnesses. All of us are called. Do y'all remember that from earlier this year? We are all called. In the middle of that word, called, is the word all. I want you to think about that. We are all all called to be a part of his mission. But do we live this way? Do we live like we're the church? I love this illustration from Tony Evans. He says, too many of us merely exist rather than live as if we are called. We suffer from what I call the same old same disease. Does this ever sound like you? Every morning you get up out of that same old bed. You go to that same old bathroom and look in that same old mirror at that same old face. You go to that same old closet to choose from those same old clothes. Then you go to that same old table to eat that same old breakfast with that same old spouse. And we'll leave that one there. And you get up and you walk out to that same old garage 
you get in that same old car and head down that same old road to arrive at that same old job. And you do the work, that same old work for that same old pay. At the end of the day, you pull into that same old garage and into that same old house to hear that same old noise from those same old kids. You sit down in that same old chair to watch those same old programs on that same old television, even if it's a 70 inch, Alan, or you read those same old headlines and then you fall into that same old bed so you can wake up the next day and start that same old routine again. Is that what some of our lives look like and feel like? Where's the sense of, of calling in a life like that? Where's, where's the sense when you go to bed tonight that you're going to wake up tomorrow on the next leg of a bigger, more exciting journey than you could ever imagine yourself? That bigger journey is the kingdom of God. And if you're a Jesus follower, you have been called to be a kingdom citizen to live as a kingdom citizen. The excitement is knowing that you're a part of his kingdom agenda. If you settle for anything less than that, you miss God's reason for redeeming you and leaving you here. We're all called. And what we want to do is help you discover God's calling, his purpose for you in his kingdom. That exciting energizing, eternally significant call that he has for your life. So what is my calling? Uh, help, help me understand what you're talking about, Don. So let's, let's define that. And I want to use a really good definition from Tony Evans this morning as well. He says, your calling is the divine mission that God has burned into your heart and equipped you to accomplish to bring him glory and to advance his kingdom. He's put it in your heart. He's, he's equipped you for something. And, and Rick Warren calls it your shape. How has he gifted you? What's your heart? What are your abilities? What kind of experiences have you had in life? What's your personality? God wants to use all of those things to accomplish his kingdom purposes. So what does he have for you? All of us have been given the same message, the same life-changing message. But here's the truth. It looks different for all of us because we're all shaped differently. We all have a different heart and a passion and, and what God has for us. So what does he have for you? Let's, let's look at some of the scripture about calling in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Paul writes, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Jesus called you into his family, into his kingdom. And so Paul is exhorting us, live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. To each one of us, we have grace, we have giftings, we have a calling for his kingdom. Second Timothy 1 9, he saved us and called us to a holy life, called us with a holy calling, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace, the grace that was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. The truth is Jesus calls all of us to a new way of life, not just one hour a week, not, just even, not even just five minutes a day. It's, it's a new way of life that he's calling us to. When you were called by God to become a part of his family, called to be his child, you were called to a divine task, called to be on mission with him. Your life and my life is 
a mission trip. So where do I start? Where do I start? Tony, again, Tony Evans says, if you want to know your calling, don't go calling looking, go God looking. You see the difference there? Don't go calling looking. Well, what can I, what can, I'm just going to dream big. What can I do for God? That's not what you do. You don't go calling looking. You go God looking because it happens in relationship with him. It all comes from his revelation of himself to you through his word through his spirit, through others in the body. His calling will be experienced out of your relationship with him. We know it. We've heard it over and over. Y'all, y'all know, quote to me John 15, 5 this morning. I'm the vine. Y'all know this, right? I'm the vine. You're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. We know it, don't we? We've heard that verse a million times. We know it. We've heard it over and over and over again. But are we living that out? Without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. How many of you charge your phones daily? I mean, yeah. If I should, Jordan laughs at me. I don't plug mine in. You know what happens when I don't plug mine in? Right in the middle of the day, when I'm trying to do something, it dies. And Jordan's like, why in the world don't you plug that thing in and charge it? It's important to plug our phones in daily, to charge our phones daily. You know why? Because it's, those things are now really essential to our lives. Without our phones, we can do nothing. Okay, this is, this is a picture of this relationship with God. How many of us are just coming once a week and feeling like this charge is going to hold for the rest of the week? Just one time for an hour. Let me, let me plug in for an hour. Let me connect to the vine for an hour who says, you know, I'm the source. I'm everything. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But I'm going to depend on this one meeting, this drop-in visit once a week to, to, to have the fuel and the energy and the fire to live out his calling in my life. The world drains us. The enemy depletes us on a daily basis. It's not enough coming to church once a week. You are the church on a daily basis. As we've been not able to gather here corporately, what has this time revealed about your personal daily relationship with God? What has it revealed about a daily relationship with him, staying connected to the vine, abiding in him with personal worship and prayer and the word of God? You can't be the church. You can't know his will and his calling if all you've got is a once a week corporate gathering. And this isn't all God wants. He doesn't just want a once a week visit. A Sunday only faith. He wants your whole life. Your whole life. All of you. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Offering your bodies daily as a living sacrifice. Denying yourselves. Taking up your cross daily. Walking with him. Abiding in him. Staying connected to the power source on a daily basis in your life. Listening to him. Seeking him. The Jesus life becomes our life. Only then can we be the church. Only then can we live out our calling. It starts on the individual level because we are the church. And it starts in our homes. It starts in our homes. That's, that's where we've been for the last several months. What does it look like in our homes? Do our homes reflect what happens when we gather here as the body? Is that what our homes look like? We don't stop being the church at home. We don't stop being the church once we walk out these doors. What does the church look like at home? 
Do we have Christ-centered homes? Is there a home environment where parents and grandparents and relatives are manifesting the love and the glory of God on a daily basis? Opening the word of God, worshiping and praying. And here's just a truth. This corporate gathering depends on the church in the home. The church in the home, that's what, that's what is the foundation for what's happening here as the body corporately. So the question is today, how can we be the church at home? How can we be the church? What does that, what does that look like, a ch the church at home? Let me give you just a few uh, things that I actually read an article and, and several of these uh, points came from that article, but they were just powerful uh, you, how do you be the church at home? You pray. It, it, it's a home that prays. You know, children will remember the rest of their lives praying together with their, in their home with their parents and their siblings. One of, one of the things, that's, that's one of the greatest memories that I have about growing up was, and, and here's the crazy thing. My, my, we drove my mother absolutely insane. Okay. She's wanting us to, to sit still and have this, have this prayer time together and to be all nice and formal and lovely. And we're fighting each other and kicking each other and punching each other. And, and she's spanking us in the middle of prayer time. But it's, it's still happening. Okay, We're praying together and we're reading some Bible stories together. And you know what? Those are some of the sweetest memories that I have in my life. And those were foundational to who I am today. And it didn't take that much effort. And I know it drove my mom crazy, but she accomplished stuff through that. Four of her children, all four of her children are now in ministry today. Praying together as a family is important. As a single, praying in your home, in a dating relationship, praying together is important. Being the church at home is a home that prays. It's also a home where the family speaks positively about the church, about the body of Christ. This goes back to our Ephesians chapter four, verses one through seven, those verses there where he's saying, maintain unity and the bond of peace. That's what I, we're one and we've got to protect that, that, that love and that peace and that unity. It's a utmost importance. And at the home, what does that look like? Are we speaking positively? Are we practicing at home what we're supposed to practice in this place? Forgiveness and grace and forbearance, making allowance for faults. The, everywhere you go, is gonna, you're going to find imperfect people. And that's the perfect opportunity to practice grace and mercy and making allowance for faults. Are we discussing the good things taking place in, in an atmosphere of grace where, where our children and, and those in our home have this positive outlook on who God is and what he's doing. Do y'all realize the power of our words? The we have the power of life and death in our words. That, that's what the scripture says. Your words have the power of life. They can give life or they can suck the life out of people. And bring death and, and criticism. What, what do our children hear when we're talking about the church? Children can learn to be positive and optimistic about being a part of the church body. Or they can turn negative and critical depending upon what they hear. Be the church at home. A home that is the church is hospitable. We want to be hospitable. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 9, offer hospitality to one another. Experience the blessings of opening your home to, to the neighborhood children. We're in a new neighborhood. I got to tell y'all, all of a sudden, we've got, every time I come home, there's three or four neighborhood kids at my house now. But that's, that's awesome. 
That's, that's, that's what we want. We want our home to be a place where, where uh, love and laughter and the church is happening, where Jesus can be found. Open your home to the neighborhood children, to schoolmates, to, to foreign students. Jim and Judy did that for so many years, inviting uh, foreign exchange students into their home. Uh, Monty and Terry, Monty met this girl from South Africa at his work. And he was like, this girl needs to come and have Thanksgiving at our house. And now she's a part of their family because the, ch the church doesn't just happen here. The church is happening at Monty's house and at Jim and Judy's house and at my house. We are the church. We want to share and love and provide a refuge for people. Foreign students, college students, if, if, if you have kids, help them to realize your home is open to everyone. There's no limit to showing Christian love to others. Sit at the table together. Break bread together at the table as a family. Fellowship. Break bread. Pray with others. Make your home a refuge. You know, my house, that was my house growing up. Everybody wanted to come hang out at my house. You know why? Because... There was love there and there was Jesus there. And you know what a lot of the kids were going through in their own homes? Divorce and ugly stuff and arguing and yelling or my parents don't even care about me. They don't talk to me. And so they wanted to be a part of something. They saw a difference. They knew that Jesus was there. It was a refuge. There was joy and love and it was the church and it wasn't in the church building. It was in the Malpass house about three or four nights a week. All because we just opened the doors and said, we're, we're, we're the church no matter where we are. Where Jesus, come experience that. It's a home where faith and love are put into action. Put our faith and love into action. This is something we learn through Love Does. Dear children, don't just talk about love. Put your love into action. And then it will truly be love. Don't just talk about it. Do it. Do something. Do something about it. There are needy adults and children longing to be loved and accepted that need to, to see the gospel demonstrated, that need to hear the gospel proclaimed. There are opportunities around us everywhere. The second greatest commandment that Jesus gives us, love your neighbor as yourself. Whoever you come across that has a need, be Jesus. Love them as you love yourself. There's so many ways to love and serve the poor, the refugees, the hungry, the homeless, the oppressed. Serve with your friends. Serve, serve, with, serve with a group of friends. Serve with your neighbors. Serve with your kids. Help them connect the church with real life. It doesn't just happen for an hour here. We are the church. And this is what the church looks like in everyday real life. Help them make that connection. It's a home characterized by generosity, extravagant generosity. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Is that, what, is that, is that what's happening in our homes? Are, are we generous with our time, with our money, with our resources? Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. Make my agenda who I am, my plans and purposes. Put those first and I'll provide all that other stuff that you need. But where's our focus on all the stuff that we feel like we need and that's what we're striving for? Or are we focused on the kingdom of God, trusting in him, showing our home, our kids, our other family members that as we seek first the kingdom of God, he said he'd take care of the rest. So let's love him. Let's focus on the needs of others, not just on ourselves. It's a home where God's design for the family is lived out. If we want to be the church at home, live out God's design. Jerry used to call it, read God's mail to you in the word. Don't read anybody else's mail. Read your mail in God's word addressed to you. And here's, here's how that goes. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Children, Bryson, Jonas, Natalia and Mila, obey your parents. 
okay? That's God's word for you. Obey your parents. Singles, be patient and devoted to the Lord. Honor God. Remain pure with your bodies. Grandparents, teach and encourage and model the faith. Pass it down to your children and your children. The blessing, your children and their children and their children. Be the church. Demonstrate his rule and reign in your home. In your home. Be the church in your home. Make it alive and vibrant in Christ. I said this earlier this year. Meredith is a missionary. Do y'all know that my wife is a missionary? She is a missionary right now in Saginaw, Texas. And she is uh, trying to reach this unreached people group that's 50% evangelized right now. Okay? Two have accepted Christ, but there's still two more that don't know Jesus yet as Lord and Savior. And so that is her calling right now. That's her job. She's a missionary to an unreached people group. And she's trying to show these two little girls who Jesus is in our home. Not just for an hour at church on Sundays, but on a daily basis in our lives as a reality as the church in the world. Worship and prayer. And this is who we are. And this is why we give. And this is why we serve. And the two boys that have already accepted Jesus. This is what it looks like to live as kingdom citizens. I want you to have a kingdom mindset. Not just thinking about us, but others around us. What does Jesus have for you? I want to help you discover what he's got for you. His calling for your life. So that we can continue to be the people that God has called us to be. Never despise the monotony of everyday faithfulness. Never despise the monotony of everyday faithfulness. Oftentimes you don't feel like you're making a difference. This is just, this is too hard. This is too much work. I don't see anything happening. But you've got to, you need a bigger picture you got to know the end game. This is, this is what I'm trying to accomplish. And everyday faithfulness will translate into everyday faithfulness in my family. Modeling that, showing that as an example. So as we close today, what has the Holy Spirit revealed to you about being the church as an individual being the church in your home? What is it that the Holy Spirit has revealed to you? How can you take one of these challenges and put that into practice this week? Begin putting it. It's never too late to, to, to start over or to start for the first time. What's one of these things you can start doing to be the church? Be the church by serving God and serving others in your own household. That's where we can start in our own household. Live out the gospel, love, grace, forgiveness, mercy, joy. How can you be Jesus to your kids, your wife, your family members, in your dating relationship, in your singleness? How can you be Jesus? Demonstrating his rule and reign begins in these closest of relationships. And here's the good news. God's not looking for perfection. He just wants our participation in the process as we become more and more like his son, Jesus. So stay in, the, stay in it. You be a disciple. Stay connected. And then go and make more. Go and make more. And you know where that starts? In the home. Starts in the home. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your unbelievable grace and mercy and forgiveness, Lord, when we are not perfect. We admit we're not perfect at any of this, and we need more of you. Father, we need to be connected to the vine, to the power source every single day. Father, we know that without you, we can do nothing. 
So I pray that you would give us a renewed heart and a vision for you as individuals, Lord, to seek you, to walk with you, to love you, to, to pray and to worship and be in your word, Lord, to know you, to, to be, be uh, prompted by your Holy Spirit, to walk in step with your spirit on a daily basis, Lord. And we want it to begin in our homes. We want to be the church in our home. Show us how we can do that, Father. Help us this week to begin to practice some of these things that we've talked about today. Lord, we want to be your kingdom people. We want to see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Fill us, send us out into the world, and let us be the church. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We hope you're blessed. We're not going to have a formal invitation time, but if God has spoken to you and you would like to, to come forward and maybe you've got some questions, you'd like someone to pray with you, please stay after the service. Uh, I'll be here at the front. You can come forward and, and we can talk and pray together. Uh, if you are at home today and you have some prayer requests, uh, call us here at the church. Uh, let us know. Email us. Um, look on our website, springdalebc.com, how you can get connected in with us. And um, we are um, just blessed, aren't we? We're blessed um, with the love of Jesus in our lives. And let's, let's be the church. Let's just be the church. I love you so much and have a great week. You are dismissed.